Let's pray. Oh Lord, how we long for that day when we enjoy the resurrection, when we see your face, when you are vindicated, when all things are put right, when we will no longer be able to sin or feel the sting of death, uh, nor the curse on creation, but when we will enjoy life in your presence eternally, unfading. Until that day, O oh God, help us to long for these things, to wait eagerly and patiently for you, and to be busy about the things you have us here for. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. As you consider what we do here together on a Sunday morning, gather in a room, in part to hear a long monologue from an old book. I don't know if you think about your friends, your coworkers, your family who don't know Christ. You pray for them, you long for them to know the Savior that you love. And you think, I wish they could come to church, but, but I know what they're going to hear. They're, it's going to be that long speech thing again. I'm going to open the Bible and just explain it verse by verse through books. And they don't like that. Couldn't, couldn't we dress it up a little bit? Couldn't we, couldn't we do a few things to tweak the, the packaging in which the truth comes? Maybe you've wanted to share the gospel. Maybe you've been involved in a, an outreach ministry, or maybe you find yourself in a conversation in the grocery store. And you feel the temptation to, if not change the message, at least make it palatable, make it attractive. Find some way to win a hearing for the truth by appealing to the things that your hearer most wants. I feel these temptations. Churches feel these temptations. Maybe you've thought, you know, there are some really good communicators out there that have obviously studied how to do this thing, and I wish there had been a class that our pastors could have gone to to just learn how to really get people to make a decision. Really, how to, how to move people with the right information and then the right techniques to get them to the point where they're ready to exchange their old life for a new one. They're ready to surrender to Christ. They're, they're ready to follow the Savior. Would that our pastors had learned these things somewhere along the line. Maybe you've thought these thoughts. I've thought these thoughts. This morning, in our continuation of a philosophy of ministry series, we're looking in to the scenery behind the Apostle Paul's preaching. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and I think there's no better place in all of our Bibles to see how Paul viewed the proclamation of the gospel. And the declaration of God's truth. In our philosophy of ministry series a few weeks ago, we looked at Paul's declaration of a foolish message in 1 Corinthians 1. The gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. And while 1 Corinthians 1 dealt primarily with the message of the gospel being foolish in the eyes of the world, 1 Corinthians 2 deals with the method of gospel proclamation as also being foolish in the eyes of the world. Three weeks ago, the message, this week, the method. And what we're going to do in 1 Corinthians 2 this morning is learn to embrace the foolishness, not only of the message of the gospel but of the method of unadorned gospel proclamation. The kind of witnessing to and declaration of the foolish message of Jesus Christ. And for that matter, the rest of the truths of God's word. To, to do that not in the trappings that 
please the world. And I think there's no better place to discover this than 1 Corinthians 2. The Apostle Paul not only embraced the foolishness of the message of the gospel, a crucified Messiah, a scandal to the Jews, a a puny God in the eyes of the Romans, and an unsophisticated philosophy to the Greeks. But Paul also embraced the foolishness of the way he was to deliver that message. That is a clear declaration of God's truth. Not dressed up in the packaging that the lost world adored. Not made attractive to the world's tastes. Not delivered in a manner to win the applause of unbelievers. And fundamentally, not with the goal of persuading unbelievers through these human means. But rather clear, unadulterated, unadorned proclamation of God's message. The heading for this comes back in chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1.17. Paul says in the second half of that verse, Christ sent me to preach, not in cleverness of speech. There's the method. And he called me to preach the gospel. There's the message. Not in cleverness of speech, the method, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. And what's at stake here is we actually lose the gospel When we compromise the message, that should be obvious enough, but we actually lose the gospel when we compromise God's method of proclaiming the gospel. And we can so often do that through good intentions and undermine the very thing that we love. Let's read together 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All 16 verses will be our text this morning. And Paul writes, when I came to you, brethren... I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predetermined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, the things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. If we are to understand Paul's meaning in 1 Corinthians 2, we must understand the Corinthian problem, the Corinthian situation. We must discover what their issue with Paul's preaching was. Why does Paul spend really four chapters, the the foundational elements of this letter to the Corinthians, defending his preaching, defending his methods? Why does he begin his letter this way with four chapters devoted to, this is the message I preach, this is how I preach it, and this is why? To understand that, to understand why why Paul is giving an apologetic for his methods, we have to spend a little time getting to know the Corinthian situation. And we're going to take a little more time than usual digging into cultural background this morning. 
since it is critical to understanding Paul's meaning, and I think it will bear much fruit in thinking about our own current situation. I believe there's no fuller treatment anywhere in Scripture on what preaching must be, on what ministry in the church must be, even what gospel proclamation for all of us must be. This has far-reaching implications for pastors, for churches, for missionaries, for parents, for students, for every Christian in this room, and it even has implications for you in this room who do not yet know Christ. So to get it right, let's take a little time this morning and dig more deeply than usual into the cultural historical setting of this part of our Bible. We need to look this morning at the backdrop of Greco-Roman rhetoric. If your kids are in some sort of a classical education, some of these names and terms will be familiar to you. Greco-Roman rhetoric is, in short, a detailed study in the ancient world of the art of persuasion. The art of persuasion. One writer has said it is the study of the discursive techniques born to induce or increase the mind's adherence to the thesis presented for the hearer's assent. Another has said, it is the art of finding and employing the most effective means of persuasion on any subject. The era, the chief era of Greco-Roman rhetoric from which our, even our modern studies of rhetoric come, is the era essentially of the New Testament, a couple centuries leading up to the New Testament, a couple centuries following Uh, The teachers of Greco-Roman rhetoric are many, Aristotle, Cicero, Quintilian, Socrates, Isocrates. What is Greco-Roman rhetoric? Plato described it this way, it is the art that leads the soul by means of words. Socrates says it is the producer of persuasion. Cicero called it the ability to influence the minds of the hearers and to turn them in whatever direction the case demands. What is the goal of Greco-Roman rhetoric? The goal is persuasion. The goal is a yielded will on the part of the wheel, not a wheel, a will. A yielded will on the part of the hearers. In fact, the word faith Our New Testament word for faith is used to describe what the goal of the orator was. To get the hearer to assent to what you're saying, to to believe it by conviction. It is a yield response to the orator's ingenuity in employing rhetorical strategies to get that yielded will. One writer said, the effectiveness of the persuader was thus measured by the degree to which his audience yielded to his rhetorical efforts. There are many tools in the tool belt of Greco-Roman rhetoric. Quintilian, who was a contemporary of the Apostle Paul and wrote 12 volumes of a textbook on rhetoric and oratory, gave five canons, five rules for how to deliver a speech if you want to persuade Invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. The orator had to be uh, ingenuitive, had to come up with creative ways to get across his material. He had to arrange it in such a fashion that it would evoke the response that was desired. He had to set up the style to accomplish a number of different things. Um, There were three basic styles that were uh, given by the teachers of rhetoric. There was the high style and the middle style and the plain style. And all of these were used by each of the orators in various times, in various seasons, in order to provoke the response that they wanted. Quintilian talked about these five rules, including the memory, being able to stock your brain so filled with resources and tools and information that they could come at a moment's notice in order to win your hearers. And then, of course, there were all the mechanics of delivery, the right physical presence, the right kind of booming voice, the the right kind of softness when appropriate, gestures, spacing, timing, knowing when to bring your speech to a climax, knowing when to draw out tears and to evoke laughter, to melt the hearers into submission so that at just the right time you could drag their wills into your cause. All of these things were critical. You had to have the logos and the pathos and the ethos. That is, you you had to employ the, the words and the information and the data 
and then you had to in, uh, bring in the emotions in order to affect the ethical response or the response of the will. Cicero said there were three functions of oratory to instruct, to delight, and to move. The orator is duty bound to instruct. Giving pleasure or delight is a free gift to the audience, and to move them is indispensable. Bound up in the study of oratory and rhetoric was the psychology of the hearer. What makes up the hearer? What is it in a hearer that will move from one idea to another? How do I get them from point A to point B? What features can I use in my speaking to move them along that path to where I want to get them? Understanding the the hearer and the psychology of the audience was critical. And of course, the really good orators, the rhetoricians, employed their own ingenuity to to take all of the tools at their disposal with the given audience at hand to accomplish the desired result. And it was powerful. It, It took years to study, decades to master, but the results were tangible. Plato said, this is the art that leads the soul by means of words. One teacher of rhetoric called it the ability to persuade with speeches. Cicero described the power of rhetoric this way. It is the ability to influence the minds of the hearers and turn them in whatever direction the case demands. He said, there is to my mind no more exceeding thing than the power, by means of oratory, to get a hold on assemblies of men, win their goodwill, direct their inclinations where the speaker wishes. He said, this eloquence has the power to sway men's minds and move them in every possible way. Now it storms the feelings, now it creeps in, it implants new ideas, and it uproots the old. Cicero described one excellent poet that had such eloquence that it was called the soul-bending sovereign of all things. Cicero said, when one hears a real orator, he believes what is said, thinks it true, assents, and approves the orator's words with conviction. The listening throng is delighted, is carried along by his words, is in a sense bathed deep in delight. They feel now joy, now sorrow. They're moved now to laughter, now to tears. They show approbation, detestation, scorn, aversion. They are drawn to pity, to shame, to regret. They are stirred to anger, to wonder, to hope, and fear. And all these come to pass just as the hearer's minds are played upon by the orator's word and thought and action. And Quintilian, who is that contemporary of the Apostle Paul, said of Cicero, he was born by the favor of providence to be the man in whom eloquence could try out all her powers. Who can give information more precisely or stir the feelings more deeply? Who had ever such gift of charm? You believe him to be winning by consent what he is really extorting by force. And when he sweeps the judge along with his violence, the judge feels not that he was being hijacked, but he is going along of his own accord. Indeed, such is the authority in everything Cicero says that one is ashamed to disagree. You can imagine the value that was placed on the skilled orator. In any walk of life that required public speaking, you want this kind of power. You want to get things done. In fact, the Greeks valued rhetoric so highly, they said, it's, it's better than warfare because people don't die. <laughs> we can move nations. We can sway opinions. We can conquer kingdoms with words. And that's better. The reach of Greco-Roman rhetoric in the New Testament era was universal. It was everywhere. Not not everybody in, in the Greek and Roman world was an orator, but everyone was a critic of oratory. Everybody knew what it was. Everybody knew its vocabulary. Everybody knew the expectations of what was required. There were the professionals, and everybody else played fantasy rhetoric. The esteem of eloquence was part of the culture. In fact, it was the pride of Greek culture. Rhetoric was said to be the crown of a liberal education. Similarly today, most people watch movies. Not many of us are movie producers, but all of us are movie critics. 
And what is it we appreciate in some cinematic presentation? We want to be moved. We want to be informed. We want to get information. We want to get emotional tug. We want a good story. We want to laugh. We want to cry. And consider the movie producer with an agenda that wants to get us somewhere. There are techniques for that. There are procedures for that. There are well-worn patterns and well-known techniques that get the audience from one place to another. Interestingly, the audience is sovereign over the producer. And we'll talk about that relationship in a moment. The esteem of skilled orators was high. Skilled orators spent years training, and those who were successful combined their years of training with natural talents and impressive physical presence. They were prized as advocates, as lawyers, successful as politicians. Uh, I can imagine they would have been successful used chariot salesmen. There were careers to be made in teaching rhetoric. And many plied their oratory skills simply for entertainment. People went to hear speeches to be entertained by the act of speaking. This brought along with it wealth and advancement. It was possible to move up the rungs of social status and wealth simply by studying rhetoric. There's a relationship between the audience and the orator. There's a deal going on. The the audience really is sovereign. The orator is playing the audience, and the audience is judging whether the orator has played them well enough to yield. (laughs) And we won't go listen to you again if you don't play me well enough to get me to yield to what you're trying to convince me of. We judge songs and plays and movies this way. I want to be moved. I'm paying good money to be moved, and I want you to use all of your skills to affect me if you're not good at it. Rotten Tomatoes. I want to contrast for just a moment two types of public speakers in the Greek world. There is the persuader whose task is to take the techniques of rhetoric and oratory and apply them to a given situation. To sort of make the equation between my tool belt the given audience and all the variables involved in the audience to get my results. The results are the standard. The results will be had based on the ingenuity of the orator and the variables in the audience. And so the lawyer, the politician, the philosopher, the entertainer, they were expected to employ all the tools of rhetoric to accomplish the goals with a given audience. And they were successful if the audience yielded. The orator is results-driven. The herald, on the other hand, had the task of representing somebody, representing some dignitary with that dignitary's message. And the herald was expected simply, clearly, accurately to convey the message given to him. And he was successful if he faithfully carried out that commission to clearly communicate the master's message. That was the herald. In the words of Dwayne Litvin, a commentator on Greco-Roman rhetoric and its application to ministry today. By the way, full disclosure, I did not spend the last 20 years of my life studying rhetoric. I just read a couple of really good books about it. According to Dwayne Litvin, he says the persuader is goals-driven and the herald is obedience-driven. What category did the Apostle Paul fit into? The category of the herald. The category of the herald whose job it was to represent his dignitary, his master, his Lord. And to clearly proclaim his master's message. And listen, he did so with a heart of persuasion. He wanted people to embrace the message. But there is a reason that he had the task of the herald, not the task of the orator. This is evident even the very vocabulary that Paul uses to describe his own ministry. 
The vocabulary of the persuasive orator was uh, techne, the art, the craft. Uh, the word persuasion is used over and over again. Uh, the word arete, one of our classical schools in the valley is named arete for excellence or the virtue of skill and proficiency. Eloquence, demonstration or proofs, wisdom and power. These are the words that would be familiar in the schools of rhetoric, important in their use. And the vocabulary of Paul's preaching is very different. Evangelism. Uh, the Greek word is evangelism. Euangelizomai is the verb. It just means to proclaim good news. Paul talks about preaching. That is the word of the herald. The noun form simply means herald. The verb form of preaching is to herald. And, and the subject matter of that which is herald is the same word, just spelled a little bit different. It is the herald's message. The herald heralds the heralded message. That's what Paul said about his own preaching. Another verb he uses is a verb to announce or report. And another word is where we get our English word martyr, which means to give testimony. Uh, is, uh, someone who's a witness giving testimony in a court of law is simply reporting what they saw. The advocate, the lawyer, on the other hand, is employing all the tools of rhetoric to bring persuasion, to win the audience, to make them yield. Paul's approach was problematic in Corinth. The literature from the day gives evidence to the fact that Corinth was a city that had its prominent schools of rhetoric and oratory and its prominent teachers contemporary with the Apostle Paul. And it's evident from the book of 1 Corinthians that they esteemed these orators. They knew the rules of rhetoric, they knew the techniques, and they couldn't figure out why Paul wouldn't employ those techniques to package this all-important message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, they called Paul's verbal proclamations contemptible. Quintilian, that contemporary of Paul's, wrote this about rhetorical power. Anything else than the skilled use of the art of persuasion by the, by the techniques of rhetoric, everything else is bare and meager and weak and devoid of charm. It is in rhetoric's power over the emotions that the life and soul of oratory is to be found. You see, the problem with using the tools of rhetoric and oratory in gospel proclamation is not primarily because rhetoric is bad. You want the salesman to sell cars. You want the lawyer to advocate. You want the politician to make his case. It's not that rhetoric, and by the way, there were some who used the techniques of rhetoric in order to convey untruths. The teachers of rhetoric hated that. They, they wouldn't have stood for that. They, they said that rhetoric belongs with truth. The problem for preaching is that preaching does not set out to accomplish natural things. It's only natural for a salesman to sell cars. It's only natural for a lawyer to advocate for his client. It's only natural for a politician to make his case. These things are appropriate. There is a place for rhetoric and persuasion and oratory. But the task of getting across God's truth can't be packaged that way. It cannot be located, the power of proclamation of God's truth cannot be located in the speaker's craft, nor in the audience's sovereignty. You see, gospel proclamation is a declaration by a herald of God's truth that there is a Savior by which sinners can be forgiven and granted eternal life. And if the skills of oratory are brought in to get somebody to make a decision, natural tools have brought about a natural response when what is absolutely necessary is a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, wherein is power and wisdom. This is why Paul was opposed 
to caving in to the demands of the Corinthians for high-sounding speech and lofty oratory and wisdom and power and all those the Corinthians knew the vocabulary of rhetoric it's all over first and second Corinthians, or first Corinthians 1 and 2 Paul knew it as well and ran away from it so there was a lot of introduction to give us the background so that I think we can clearly understand this text and it will help us draw out some implications for ministry today Here's the main idea for 1 Corinthians 2. The Apostle Paul embraced the foolishness of the message he proclaimed and the foolishness of the method by which he proclaimed it. And we're going to look this morning at four commitments that undergirded Paul's preaching. Four commitments that undergirded Paul's preaching. The first commitment is this. Paul resisted the persuasive techniques that the Corinthians esteemed. First five verses. Notice Paul's vocabulary as he describes how he did and did not speak among the Corinthians, proclaiming in verse 1, a message in verse 1, and preaching. And notice what Paul resisted, the superiority of speech and the superiority of wisdom in verse 1. He says, when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. Bear declaration that Paul bears witness to. Notice verse 2. Paul says, I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This was the foolish message we talked about three weeks ago. The foolish message that Tom put in front of us this morning during the communion time. Now you have to understand here, Paul is not a know-nothing This is not a statement that the only thing you're ever allowed to say is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's not what Paul did at Corinth. In fact, in this very chapter, Paul's going to tell us a lot of things he knows. Wisdom in verse 6. Wisdom that transcends our time, verse 6. God's wisdom, verse 7. The mysteries of God from before the foundation of world, verse 7. Things that, the things of God that man with his own resources cannot access, verses 8 and 9. The depths of God by divine revelation, verse 10. And then he goes on to say, we know the thoughts of God in verses 11 and 12. And then finally in verse 16, he asks the question, who has known the mind of the Lord, but we possess the mind of Christ. Paul's not saying, I don't know anything. I only have one phrase and I just say that all the time. It's clear what Paul spoke and wrote to the Corinthian believers is a great deal more than the crucifixion of Jesus. What Paul means when he says, I determined to know nothing, is a contrast to the orators of his day. Paul determined not to couch the message of Christ in the language of rhetoric. Rather than what the Corinthians would have considered powerful, persuasive, rhetorical skill, Paul said, I have determined to know none of that. (laughs) Simply, Christ crucified. God's message unadorned, not dressed up. Notice what Paul says. He came to them in weakness, verse 3, and fear and much trembling. That is not what the Corinthians looked for in a public speaker. (laughs) What was the source of this weakness, fear, and much trembling? A number of suggestions have been offered. One is Paul came with physical ailments. Uh, He suffered them from time to time. Uh, Very likely they could have rendered him unimpressive to a group of people groomed to be critics of public speakers. Maybe Paul knew that he didn't have the look, the sound that they were looking for. You know, when your job is to share the gospel with a bunch of rowdy football players and, and you know they won't listen to the small armed captain of the chess club. He knew he didn't have their look and their style and the impressive presence that was expected. Acts 16, 17, and 18 actually tell us about Paul's approach to Corinth. He was in Philippi where he was put in jail. Then he went to Thessalonica where he was forced forced to escape by night. Then he went to Berea where he was well received by some but then had to escape again. Then he went to Athens where he was alone, isolated, depressed, sad, wandering around, provoked in his heart over the idolatry that he saw, and then he proclaims with mixed results. And on the heels of all of these things comes to Corinth in Acts 18. 
trembling, weak, and in fear. That would be totally understandable if he's going, what is awaiting me in the next city? Some have suggested that the weakness, fear, and trembling is actually the way Paul saw himself before God, and that his statement here is a reflection of his holy fear of the Lord, his utter dependence upon him for strength, and the free admission of his own intrinsic inability to achieve eternal results. I came to you weak. Yeah, I'm always weak. (laughs) I came to you trembling. I'm always trembling before the Lord. And I came to you in fear, fear of him. It could be a mixture of all of these things. Whatever the reasons for Paul's weakness and fear before them, the Corinthian culture was not impressed. This was not what they were looking for in a public speaker. It was not the self-assured, polished, lofty, sweeping, powerful oratory that they appreciated. It didn't follow all of the rules to drive us to this conclusion where we would yield. Verse 4, Paul said, My message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom. Paul determined to do something different than the Corinthians esteemed. They actually considered it contemptible. Perhaps they echoed the sentiments of Quintilian. Such speech was bare and meager, weak and devoid of charm. Notice the second half of verse 4. My message and my preaching weren't in persuasive words of wisdom, but they were in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul picks up one of the rhetoric words, demonstration, but it is not a demonstration by means of his human skill, but it is a demonstration of something otherworldly, the Holy Spirit and power. And how did Paul's words actually come to the Corinthians? Acts 18 verses 8 to 11. After reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and Gentiles there, uh, they eventually resisted and blasphemed. In verse 8, Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid any longer. Uh, Did Paul have fear? Probably fear of man? Yeah. But go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And Paul settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God to them. So Paul is writing this letter to to the Corinthian believers well after Acts 18, after the experience of Corinthian believers actually getting saved. Coming to faith through, through Paul's simple proclamation of the gospel, not like the orators they esteemed. This is a demonstration, not of the orator's prowess, not his skill in selecting the correct rhetorical tools for his audience in order to achieve the desired results, but a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of real power that caused them to be born again. So Paul is committed in this letter well after the fact of their conversion, to the same methodology that actually brought them to Christ. And and I find it ironic. Many times, you know, we recognize at, at some level that I don't know what happened to me, but God saved me. And we turn from that amazing awareness that God saved me to thinking, man, how, how can I get other people to be saved? What are the tricks of the trade? What are the tools? What must I do? What are the procedures? What are the arguments? What are the... And we forget. The Corinthians forgot. And so they even had set up factions amongst themselves about which orator they liked the better. Their love of esteem at a human level infiltrated the ministry of the church. So Paul says in verse 5, so that... I did, what did I do? I determined to do nothing but Christ and Him crucified, not in persuasive words, but in real power. I determined these things so that, verse 5, your faith would not rest on the power of men, but on the power of God. This was Paul's intentional philosophy of preaching. You see, a man persuaded and a man born again are two totally different phenomena. The Corinthian believers are proof that the unadorned proclamation of the gospel is the power and wisdom of God. 
there's a second commitment Paul makes that undergirds all of his preaching. He trusted God's perspective on his message and method. In verse 6, we get a transition from, what do the Corinthians think about my preaching? To, what does God think about it? Verses 6 to 9. Yet, we do speak wisdom amongst those who are mature. A wisdom not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age had understood. For if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. This is a transition to the way God views Paul's preaching. It is wisdom. And it's wisdom, notice, among the mature. Among the mature. They might be blue-collar, unsophisticated, weak, ignoble, the base things of the world in the world's eyes. But the mature understand where true wisdom and true power are found. Not in the ingenuity of man, but in the wisdom of God that transcends this age. And what is God's perspective on the wisdom of this age? Verse 6, the rulers of this age are passing away. Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, they're dead. And even though Western civilization has depended on them for centuries for the art of persuasion, it is merely human, merely natural. And all those who lord it over this earth pass away. The rulers that crucified Christ pass away. Even the spiritual rulers in the heavenlies will pass away. But God's wisdom is timeless, verse 7. We speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom that God predestined before the ages. Listen, the wisdom you and I have simply, clearly proclaimed in the Scriptures was around a lot longer than Aristotle. And it'll be around a lot longer after. And God's wisdom, verse 7, results in our glory. Listen, the glory and power and esteem that came to the skilled orator far surpassed by the glory that comes to simple believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, God's wisdom was totally missed by the movers and the shakers of this world. They whiffed. If they had understood it, if they had understood real power, true wisdom, timeless truth that transcends culture and circumstance, they would not have crucified Jesus, but they did. And it proves that they're not as wise and smart and powerful as they thought they were. And all of this, verse 9, was God's design. A quote from Isaiah 64, 4. Things that, stuff, uh, things that man could never have come up with, God did. A third commitment that undergirded Paul's ministry and preaching, Paul recognized the spiritual nature of God's revelation. Paul recognized the spiritual nature of God's revelation. Verses 10 to 13 is all about God's revelation of truth in the first century to the apostles, to the apostles and prophets, that foundational layer of truth giving to the church when there was yet no Bible. Ephesians 2.20 says the apostles and New Testament prophets are the foundation of the church. Paul picks up this theme in the very next chapter in 1 Corinthians 3, saying that he is laying a sure foundation. And you have to be careful how you, us, we build on it. Paul and his associates, the purveyors of the message of the gospel, the apostles, those receiving direct revelation of God, received spiritual things. They, Paul understood the spiritual nature of what God was revealing. God revealed them. He says, who is it, verse 11, who knows what a man's thinking You can't know what I'm thinking unless I tell you. And we can't know God's mysteries unless he tells us. Verse 11, who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of man within him? Not the Holy Spirit, but your own mind. And even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. Listen, if we are to know God's wisdom, it's not coming by human means. It is only coming by the Holy Spirit of God who chooses to reveal them. 
And that is exactly what Paul is claiming. His message was the direct revelation of God to him by the Holy Spirit, which essentially comprises New Testament. You and I have access to these very real transcendent truths in our Bibles. Paul's claim in verse 10 was that God revealed them to him. In verse 12, that God freely gave them to him. This is the work of the Holy Spirit in Revelation. We have to be careful with the word we here. Look at verse 13. Um, Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. You and I are tempted to read we as you and me, us in this room. That's not how Paul is using we. If you follow the pronouns beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2 and follow it all the way through, Paul is talking about himself. And by proxy, his apostolic associates proclaiming New Testament doctrine by revelation through the Holy Spirit. Paul is not giving a promise here that, that we get new revelation by the Spirit of God. As if God is talking to us directly. God has spoken. It's in his word. The we that Paul is referring to is we as in him and his associates. And so he says, we've received them. The reason Paul can speak unashamedly without all of the adornment of rhetorical flourish is because he knows the author of this content. And he knows the real power of it. It, These are spiritual things. This section of Paul's argument is all about God's revelation In the first century, Paul is pressing the spiritual nature of God's revelation over against the natural character of the wisdom of men. This is why Paul says in verse 13, he did not package his truth, God's truth, in human wisdom. Verse 13, not in words taught by human wisdom. He's talking about methodology, vocabulary, but rather, and notice this, in those words taught by the Spirit. You see, Paul did not feel free to take God's spiritual truths, the revelations of God's truth that came to him by the Spirit of God. He did not feel free to take these realities, hitch them to the latest insights of persuasive oratory, hoping to give God a boost through human cleverness. No, he knew that human ingenuity would only contaminate the glorious wisdom and supernatural power of God. And so he says, literally, combining spirituals with spirituals. Uh, New American Standard Bible says, combining uh, spiritual things or spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And this word for combining here can be the idea of combining or even interpreting. The same word was used of Joseph's dreams. He interpreted dreams. That is, God's truths only come through the Holy Spirit's words. How are God's thoughts to be interpreted or, or brought to bear to people? By God's method, the Holy Spirit's own vocabulary. These are God's truths, unadorned, undiminished, unapologetically heralded by faithful proclamation. God couched his truth in the words he chose by his Holy Spirit. Spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Not spiritual truths with human cleverness, human packaging. And so Paul could do nothing else but stick to God's foolish message proclaimed in a manner that the world would consider foolish. And all of this by God's design. Paul was driven by obedience, not by results. He hadn't made a deal with the audience. He wouldn't subject the truth of God to a line. What do I need to do today to get you into a brand new worldview? You see, if the audience, if the critics are allowed to dictate the terms by which they will accept or reject a message, then they will always be sovereign. And the call of the gospel is to repent of your sovereignty, to surrender. The orator believes he's playing the crowd and he knows that he is being played by the crowd. If his performance is not good, they will reject him. If they are not moved by him, they will let him know. The message of the cross 
and the methods of Greco-Roman rhetoric are fundamentally at odds with each other. You can't package the gospel in a method that undermines the gospel, and Paul knew that. That led to a fourth commitment that undergirded his preaching and ministry. I'll just mention it. (laughs) Paul expected a mixed response to God's truth. Paul expected a mixed response to God's truth. He was not results-driven. Do whatever I have to do with the tools available to me to get them to yield. He stopped at the end of his job description. He can't produce new birth. Right? A man must be born born from above, not by the will of man. That includes the preacher. That includes the parent. That includes the neighbor. That includes the missionary. Who is the natural man? This is the unbeliever. Um, It it just means worldly. Um, James 3.15 says it this way, the wisdom of this world is not which comes down from above. It is earthly, natural, same word, and demonic. The natural man does not accept and cannot understand the things of God. What a tragedy when the church takes up the cause of doing whatever it can to get the natural man to accept. You see, whatever tools you pick up as the tools of persuasion, you, you have persuaded the natural man to those tools. Whatever the Holy Spirit draws a man to in the gospel is permanent, eternal, And so we embrace the foolishness. We get accustomed to a mixed response. Tragically, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul tells the Corinthian believers, I cannot address you as mature, as spiritual, but as fleshly, as to infants in Christ. Listen, he he calls them believers, but infants, acting like mere men. He doesn't call them natural. He doesn't call them the natural man, but he's saying you're thinking in natural categories. You're behaving as mere men. We could illustrate this principle throughout church history beyond Corinth. The Second Great Awakening and Charles Finney's new measures where he decided to do whatever he could to get people to make a decision. Uh, American evangelical Christianity has inherited Finney's new measures the tent revival, the altar call, uh, changing the lighting and the music and doing whatever you can to get people to make a scent. From the seeker church to the relevant church to the emergent church, all of these attempts in ministries are an attempt to use the tools of the art of persuasion to set up the heart's condition just right with the right story, humor in just the right moments, and then get them. (laughs) Cultural awareness becomes critical. The orators talked about understanding the psychology of the audience, what variables exist in the audience and what variables are in my tool belt and how can I put these things together to get my intended results. Today, our cultural awareness is so critical in the eyes of the world. What will make me sound as the presenter in touch with the wisdom of my hearers? So I have to consider my surroundings. If if I'm in an intellectual crowd, I use big words to impress. If I'm in a blue-collar crowd, I go blue-collar. We adorn our gospel presentation in, in whatever the trappings are that seem wise to the audience, the sovereign audience. Now listen, Paul did adapt his vocabulary and his methods. You could see the difference between Acts 16 and Acts 17, between a Jewish audience in the synagogue and a Greek audience in Athens. But he did not adjust his techniques to bring about the persuasive moment. Paul adjusted for clarity. For clarity. Not cleverness. He sought the unadored gospel to be understood. Not a dressed up gospel to persuade. Do you understand the difference? 
In our day, there are buzzwords you must use to win a hearing, to be considered wise. There, there are things you must address, things you must say. And if you don't say them, if you don't tip your hat to them, you're not going to win a hearing. Nobody's going to listen. Whether it's environmental concerns, um, whether it's being woke enough, whether it's the Me Too movement, whether it is the language of brokenness or abuse or privilege. Listen, you, you cannot be a public speaker today. You cannot be a public persona if you're not tuned in to the latest trends of acceptable vocabulary, to the cause of the day. Newscasters lose their jobs. Sportscasters lose their jobs. You can't be a teacher, a singer, an actor, a politician. You can't even be a non-speaking public persona if you don't engage in the right messaging. Consider the pressure that puts on the proclaimer of the gospel. Wait, the message you're telling me, is it going to solve the things that I think are the cause of the day? If not, not listening. We have to be attuned to the psychological categories of our audience. So what are the felt needs? What is a, what is a, a young family demographic in a church in suburban America need to hear? Let me touch those buttons. Then they'll listen to the gospel. No, they haven't got the gospel. They've got their own idolatries that you just fed them. Trying to appease them, trying to gain and keep a hearing. And listen, whatever you gain them with is what you have to keep them with. The thought that you can win people over with what they consider wise and someday trick them into repenting, it's the worst kind of bait and switch. The problem with the tools of persuasion applied to the task of heralding God's truth is not that they're inherently sinful. <laughs> it's just that they're natural. They're human. And they bring about human natural results. And, and if we employ those things for gospel proclamation, they will bring about false results. You know what Charles Finney said at the end of his life? In despair. I guess it was my lot in life to bring about tens of thousands of spurious conversions. People who made a decision because he persuaded them who weren't Christians and went to hell. This infatuation that the Corinthians had is the infatuation we can be tempted by. It's one of the root causes of the multi-site, high-production value, celebrity-staffed ministries that said, what we need is to get so-and-so celebrity in here to endorse the message. That's what the world thinks is powerful, wise, noble. What a tragedy. When the world tells the church what to say or how to say it, and the church listens <laughs> And the world doesn't get saved. <laughs> there are implications for us. You can think about implications for your parenting. Uh, is your parenting results driven or obedience driven? And I don't mean your kid's obedience. I mean your obedience. <laughs> Listen, you know how to say things and do things and use a certain tone of voice to get things done. You can get results with your kids. It's counterproductive. Will you obey the Lord and do things his way? Will you be obedience-driven in your parenting? And listen, your job description only goes so far. You can't produce new birth in your kids, even though it's the thing you most desperately want. And so you stay faithful to your commission as a herald and taxi driver and coach and everything else you do as a parent. Think about your personal evangelism. Are you obedience-driven or results-driven? Oh, man. I, I just offended that guy with the gospel. Maybe I'm in a Muslim culture. I'm not going to say son of God. Uh, this, this person doesn't want to talk about sin, so we'll talk about brokenness. <laughs> This person doesn't want to think about their offense before a holy God, so uh, we'll just talk about mistakes, we'll talk about complications, we'll just soften the whole deal. There, I'm changing the content. We also feel the temptation to change the packaging 
How can I be persuasive with this person? And, and, and your task is to be a herald. And, and of course, there are implications for preaching. The whole schools of preaching actually follow all of the schools of rhetoric that we surveyed this morning. That's how you preach. That's the art of persuasion. What is preaching if it's not persuasion? Listen, don't you want people to follow Christ? Don't you want people to know him? Don't you want people to change their lives and do better and try harder? Don't you want that? Yeah, okay. Well, persuade them. And here's the tricks. You can go to school for this. The tearjerker story, the well-placed humor, the perfectly alliterated outline points. Maybe incorporate imagery. You know, drama, skit, what, you know, those things kind of come and go. Martin Lloyd-Jones, at the turn of the other century, early 1900s, actually removed the stage, the theater stage, where they were doing drama, like 1900, early 1900s, and replaced that theater stage with a pulpit. Nothing new under the sun. Maybe you put movie clips, maybe you just... Resort to movies altogether. Listen, they're powerful. Music is powerful. We admit the effect that, that the, a well-placed story, swelling music, dramatic scenery, beautiful pictures, someone else crying or laughing tugs at us, even changes our deep-seated convictions and makes us do things. We understand that. Listen, you can learn to do these things if you think that's where the power is. Stir the soul, move the emotions, the tone, gestures, your pace, all designed to evoke a decision, a commitment, a yielding. How did Paul see the task of preaching? How did Paul see the task of ministry? Clear proclamation, not human ingenuity. Let's pray. God, thank you for these foundational paradigms in your word to help us think through how to go about your business your way. And truly, we are nothings. We do not have what it takes to accomplish the things you've called us to do. We recognize our role as instruments and blunt instruments at that in the hands of a precision surgeon doing supernatural things in the heart of man. And we just beg you, O oh God, that we would be faithful to your methods, we would be faithful to your message, and that you would be pleased to draw people to yourself from every tongue and tribe and nation and people in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in this very room. And we ask it in Jesus' name, in whom is the power.